Uh, it's hard to suppress the thought that Obama's support for the violent overthrow of Honduran democracy might be related to the utility of the unsinkable aircraft carrier for the ongoing project of militarization of Latin America, which Obama is carrying out following Bush's programs, as usual, uh, in reaction to the dangerous drift of uh, Latin America towards independence. It's a very significant story that I put aside here. Well, there's a lot to say about the efforts that Reagan and company had taken to try to elicit some Libyan action to justify the planned April 1986 bombing. It included naval operations in Libya's Gulf of Sidra a couple of weeks earlier, killing dozens of Libyans, sinking many ships, also flights by the U.S. Air Force over Libyan territory, and the obvious effort to uh, elicit some anti-aircraft fire that would provide uh, certain knowledge of Libyan infamy. Uh, but uh, let's put aside this shameful record of provocation, uh, lies, and gratifying slaughter of Libyans, despite its evident relevance to the uh, war on terror that was redeclared, not declared, redeclared by Bush 20 years later and being carried out by Obama. And let's return instead to Kinda and her murdered sister and friend. Uh, it's fair, I think, to regard these little girls as symbols of many years of horrific crimes and uh, intentional ignorance, phrase of human right and rights investigator Michael Glennon is uh, referring to the non-reaction to Reagan's terrorist atrocities in Central America. The thought that the children should be regarded in that manner came to my mind vividly last November 30th when I listened to an eloquent address by Father Jan Sabrino He's the one survivor of the assassination 20 years earlier of six leading Latin American intellectuals, Jesuit priests, by a US-run elite uh, Salvadoran force uh, fresh from renewed training by US special forces, having already left a bloody trail of thousands of the usual victims. Uh, Father Sabrino reminded the audience at Boston's Jesuit University that the killers had also murdered two women, uh, Julia Elba and her daughter Celine, Selena. Uh, they've been forgotten even more completely than uh, the uh, murdered Jesuits. Uh, 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 the reason for their murder was straightforward. Uh, the orders given to Washington's elite battalion specified that no witnesses should survive. So Julia Elba and Selena were what's called collateral damage. Uh, a few days before the 20th anniversary commemoration uh, on November 30th, at which Father Sabrina spoke, the Spanish press published a copy of the document uh, of, uh, that had ordered the assassination, signed by the chief of staff and his associates all of them so closely connected to the Pentagon and the U.S. Embassy that it becomes even harder to imagine uh, that uh, Washington was unaware of the plans of its model battalion. Now, these revealing discoveries, as far as I can determine, have passed unreported elsewhere in the West. In his talk, Father Sabrino described Julia Elba and Selena as the symbols of the suffering masses of El Salvador and the world, much like Kinda, Rafa, and Raja, and also symbols of the convenient intentional ignorance of the perpetrators who are deeply immersed in the culture of imperialism and obedient to its dictates. In the month, the month of November, last November, as I'm sure you'll recall, was devoted to the celebration of the 20th anniversary of the liberation of Eastern Europe from Russian tyranny, a victory of the forces of love, tolerance, nonviolence, the human spirit, and forgiveness, as one of the 
heroes of this moment, these momentous events, uh, Václav Havel, uh, declared to much awe and acclaim. Uh, less attention, in fact, zero, was devoted to the brutal assassination of his Salvadoran counterparts a few days after the Berlin Wall fell. Uh, the murder of the Jesuits, Jesuit intellectuals, closed the decade of horrors in, Central, in El Salvador that had opened with the uh, assassination of the archbishop by much the same hands, and the even worse atrocities elsewhere in Central America, all tracing back primarily to Washington, part of the war on terror. Uh, but the historical significance of the forgotten November 1989 assassinations goes far beyond Reagan's terrorist wars of the 1980s. Uh, the murders delivered a virtual death blow uh, to liberation theology. That was the heretical uh, doctrine that was inspired by Pope John the Twenty Third in 1962, when he called Vatican II, and sought to revive the Gospels uh, for the first time since the fourth century, when the Emperor Constantine adopted Christianity as the Church of the Roman Empire, uh, converting the persecuted church to a persecuting church, in the words of the eminent theologian and historian of Christianity, Hans Kuhn. Uh, in the post-Vatican II attempt to revive the Christianity of uh, the pre-Roman period, pre-imperial period, uh, priests, uh, nuns, and laypersons uh, took the message of the Gospels, which was, of course, radical pacifist. Uh, that's why Christians were persecuted. Uh, took the Gospels to poor and persecuted people, encouraged peasants to take their fate into their own hands and to work together to try to overcome the misery of survival in the harsh realms of U.S. power. Uh, the preferential option for the poor, as it was called, drawn directly from the Gospels uh, and adopted by the Latin American church, it was recognized by the emperor very quickly to be a grave and intolerable heresy. And the reaction was swift, uh, beginning with the installation of a vicious uh, terror and torture national security state in Brazil, the military coup planned by Kennedy, Kennedy administration and carried out shortly a couple of weeks after Kennedy's assassination. Uh, that was the first stage of a plague of repression uh, without parallel uh, since the days of the conquistadors. It spread over South America under Washington's guidance, uh, left many religious martyrs, uh, all forgotten for the usual reasons, uh, wrong agency. The near final blow to the preferential option for the poor was in November 1989. Now, the emperor is quite proud of this achievement. The School of the Americas, which has since been renamed, uh, which is famous for training Latin American killers, uh, advertises as one of its talking points, I'm quoting, that liberation theology was defeated with the assistance of the U.S. Army. We got rid of this gospel's heresy. Well, that's uh, made a couple of remarks about the end of the Cold War in 19, November 1989. It might be useful to look at the origins of that international conflict. Uh, these are events in which uh, Princeton's own Woodrow Wilson played an illuminating role. Uh, the prominent Cold War scholar, John Lewis Gaddis, uh, quite plausibly traces the origins of the conflict to the Bolshevik takeover of Russia in 1917. And uh, he writes that uh, the immediate Allied intervention was undertaken in self-defense, uh, and for Woodrow Wilson was inspired above all else uh, by his fervent desire to secure self-determination in Russia. Uh, Gaddis adds that the 1918 Western invasion, quoting him now, was undertaken in response to a profound and potentially far-reaching intervention by the new Soviet government in the internal affairs, not just of the West, but of virtually every country in the world, uh, namely the revolution's challenge 
which could hardly have been more categorical to the very survival of the capitalist order. Gaddis goes on to criticize Soviet historians, quoting still, who see the Western intervention as shocking, unnatural, and even a violation of the legal norms that should exist between nations. That stance is absurd, he instructs them. One cannot have it both ways. Uh, complaining about a Western invasion, while the most profound revolutionary challenge of the century was mounted against the West, namely by changing the internal so social order inside Russia and proclaiming revolutionary intentions. Uh, in short, under the, uh, these are not marginal comments. This is the leading whole Cold War historian quoting. Uh, in short, under the uh, intellectual guidance of the idealist US president, in 1918, the West was already exercising the right of self-defense against future attack that was invoked by the Reaganites when they bombed Libya. In 1918, it was self-defense against an ideological threat, similar to our self-defense against the heretical return to the Gospels in 1962, crushed at last uh, by the November 1989 assassination, so it's hoped. Uh, in his uh, scholarly history of Soviet-American relations, uh, George Kennan expands on Gaddis's analysis. He writes that Lenin's dissolution of the Constituent Assembly in January 1918 initiated the Cold War conflict with an element of finality. The idealistic Woodrow Wilson was particularly distraught. Kennan continues, that's a reflection of his uh, strong attachment to constitutionality, which was deeply offended by the sight of a government with no mandate beyond the bayonets of the Red Guard. That's Kennan. Uh, while he was distraught at this uh, shocking scene, clearly intolerable to the liberal conscience, uh, Wilson dispatched his Marines uh, to Haiti to dissolve the National Assembly in occupied Haiti uh, by genuinely Marine Corps methods, in the words of the Marine commander, uh, Smedley Butler. The reason was that the Haitian uh, legislature had refused to ratify a U.S. written constitution uh, that would permit U.S. corporations to buy up Haitian lands. Uh, a Marine-run plebiscite uh, remedied the problem under Washington's guns. Uh, the Constitution was ratified by a 99.9% majority with 5% of the population participating, namely the wealthy collaborationist elite. Uh, Wilson's strong attachment to constitutionality was unmoved uh, by the sight of a government with no mandate uh, beyond the bayonets of the Marines, uh, nor Kennan's. And perhaps that's because the new constitution was progressive, uh, so U.S. commentators explain. Uh, plainly, Haiti needed U.S. investment, and one could hardly expect American investors to develop the country unless they owned it. Well, all of this is gone from history, <clears throat> along with uh, Wilson's restoration of virtual slavery, uh, marine massacres and terror that left thousands of course corpses and many medals for the killers and numerous other crimes. Uh, Wilson also invaded the other half of Hispaniola, the Dominican Republic, at the same time. Uh, that invasion was devastating enough, but uh, far less destructive than Haiti because the inhabitants of the Dominican Republic had a preponderance of white blood and culture, the State Department explained, while the Haitians are inferior people, Negro for the most part, and almost in a state of savagery and complete ignorance. So it was actually out of a sincere desire to help suffering Haitians that the U.S. forced them at gunpoint to allow U.S. investors to take over their country in an unselfish intervention carried out in a fatherly way with no thought of preferential advantages commercial or otherwise for ourselves, and as you can guess, I'm quoting the New York Times editors, uh, <laughs> adopting a posture that uh, 
is still found in some academic 